Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to the end. What we find here is a powerful response. Let's start with this. Do you make much of Christ as the one of whom there is none greater? Do, does your life revolve around Christ? Do you see your desperate need and cry out to him that he would take up residence in your heart, that he would sustain you daily and protect you daily? Do you trust and value him through the gospel? Do you believe in the testimony of the gospel? Does your life and lips confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Do you make much of Christ as the one of whom there is none greater? That really captures the theme, I think, of Christ's response. And I want to just take you through the book of Matthew to get us here. How do we get here? So I want to go back to chapter 1 and just peruse through the text all the way, and I'm going to go very rapidly. In chapter 1, Christ is from and yet greater than Abraham. He is greater than David, for he fulfills the promises to both Abraham and David. He is greater than every other conception of a Savior because he saves his people from their sins. And though he is fully man, he is greater than any mere man, for he is God with us. In chapter 2, though Jesus is the king of the Jews, he is greater than all the kings of the Jews because even the Gentiles will come and worship him. He is greater than all the fulfillment of prophecy. He is greater than the good shepherd of Israel because he came to care and to call people for himself from all nations to rejoice the hearts of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. In chapter 3, he is greater than the greatest prophet. For the greatest of prophets prepare the way for him. He is greater than all righteousness because he himself fulfills all righteousness. He is greater than all the children of God because he uniquely is the one and only son of God who always does what is pleasing to the father. In chapter 4, he is greater than Abraham and sorry, greater than Adam because he conquers temptation where Adam failed. He is greater than the most powerful devil because he is greater than the, all the forces of evil. He is greater than darkness for he is the great light of the world. He is greater than all teachers and greater than all healers. In chapter 5 through 7, he is greater than Moses, for he gives a greater word. He is greater than the law and the prophets because he fulfills them. And indeed, in chapter 7, we find him concluding his Sermon on the Mount, wherein he shows that he is greater than all righteousness from religious duty. Why? Because in the end, there are only two gates and two roads, the way of the world or him. There are only two trees and two fruits, imposters or trees and fruits that are made right and healthy in him. There are two words and two wills, not what is done, but what is to be known by him. There are two hearers and two builders, those who hear him without change and those who build their life on him. In chapter 8 through 9, he is greater than all the powers of the curse. He is greater than disease and illness and blindness and muteness and deafness and even death. He is greater than all the powers of nature, for he calms the storms. He is greater than all the powers of darkness, for he casts out demons. He is greater than all earthly authority, for he forgives sin. In chapter 10, he is greater than all all and any possible cause, mission, or initiation. He is greater than any other possible person to whom you may be related. He is greater than 
all other fears and he is greater than all other rewards. And in chapter 11, we see that he is greater than all other promises. He is greater than all the prophets. He is greater than all other lights and rejection of him. Rejection of him is greater than the rejection of anything else whatsoever. Greater than the Sabbath, and he is greater than all the priests, and he is greater than the temple. There is none greater than Christ. And yet this Christ is being rejected by his own people. He is being indeed in chapter 12, he has been rejected by his covenant nation. And it is exactly at this point that the faithful line has been crossed. Like in John 1, 1, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So the holy has been called evil by the representatives of righteousness. They are seeing and not perceiving. And this is their finality. Israel has maligned her Messiah They counter his greatest messianic sign by by personally assaulting and blaspheming his personal anointing. For he is anointed personally by the presence of God the Holy personally in the spirit personally and they blaspheme his anointing. It is the greatest Assault that they could ever give against his claim to be Messiah, anointed. Indeed, only an evil and adulterous generation could so jealously hate one of whom there is none greater. That's where we're at. And so how does Jesus respond? He indicts his generation that rejects him in three movements. He addresses their proud hearts of unbelief in three peculiar responses. And I want to look at them each. In fact, let me just give you an overview of the message and let's dive in deeper. But let's, let's look at the overview. What happens here? Israel has just maligned her Messiah and now she's demanding a sign. And he responds by indicating that the nation, this generation, which he repeats, that will crucify him, this generation is corrupt, evil, adulterous, and he challenges the authority by which they make their judgments. Secondly, he then steps in and he issues a final warning by telling a story that powerfully illustrates the grave danger of neutrality, pretended neutrality. And lastly, he demonstrates as a shocking picture that stresses the non-negotiable necessity of his centrality. Jesus is the one of whom there is none greater And here he responds. Let's look at them one at a time. Number one is authority. He addresses their wrong sense of authority. Look at verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. They ask for a sign. (laughs) This is... What a strikingly odd request. They've just been witnesses to the greatest messianic sign of all. The crowds are astonished. They declare him son of David. And now they ask for a sign after they declare him to be working from Satan. But here we need to see this. The word sign in Matthew is calculated. You see, they're not asking for yet another miracle They want something more explicit. The same kind of thing is meant in John 6.30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? It's in concert with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. For Jews demand signs. They're challenging him to produce to produce irrefutable evidence 
That's what they're doing. Prove it to us. But they don't expect to be satisfied. What could it satisfy them? Demanding irrefutable proof. Well, that's the words of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the one who said to Moses, prove yourself by working a miracle. Or how about even more than Pharaoh? These are the words. This is the hard approach of Satan himself. The devil is the one who said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. You see, beloved friends, the perverse heart assumes the authority of self. The perverse heart stands over and above God in his claims and judges. He's got an authority problem. What is the use here in this request? What, what would convince them? What trickery is needed? What we see in the text is that here the scribes, the scribes are added to the mix. Why? Well, because they're the experts in the scriptures. So what's happening here is it's an authority issue. By what authority do you do these things? So verse 39, he answered them. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. An evil and adulterous generation. Solidarity to the whole of the people based upon their leadership. Solidarity wherein Christ looks upon his people and says, no, you have an appearance of righteousness of faithfulness to the covenant of your God, but you are adulterers. Your heart is far from me. They seek for a sign, he says, epizete. Not just zete, which is to seek after, but epi, which is to accentuate over and above, beyond, it intensifies. You consistently, constantly seek intensely for signs. But he refuses to play their game, doesn't he? And anyway, the whole idea is that a sign is given. Signs from God are gifts. Nobody, nobody has the right to demand that God prove himself. Signs are not God's attempts to convince skeptics. The one of whom none is greater stands before them. No sign is needed. The one of whom none is greater. And they demand a sign. Well, the way he responds here, he'll respond again. In chapter 16, verse 4, where it says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. He's going to hold to this claim. He's effectively saying, I'm done Wooing you, Israel. He says the prophet Jonah will be the sign. Remember the prophet Jonah? He preached repentance. And the wicked Ninevites repented. Not only did he preach repentance, but the explicit point of comparison is next stated. It's not just that he preached repentance because... The sign that Jesus here says he'll give is in the future. He has been preaching repentance. So that's not specifically the sign. The sign is in the future. He says the sign that will be given, future tense. And then he says what it is, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man, the title of Messiah, himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He quotes verbatim from Jonah, the prophet. And don't let your Western way of thinking trip up here. Three days, three nights. Wait a second. That, that's not how the language was used among the Hebrews. In fact, the, day, the word for day is ona, and the rabbis wrote this, and I quote, a day and a night make an ona, and a part of an ona is as the whole. The point is, it doesn't require full completion of each part to be counted a day. 
So when Matthew writes in 1621 on the third day, or when he writes in 2763 after three days, or when he writes here three days and three nights, they're all the same. He's simply saying three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on the third day he rises. What is the point? What is the point? The sign that will be given, he points to Jonah. And the sign is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. That's the sign that he gives. And most explicitly, it is the most explicit anticipation he has, he has given thus far. Resurrection is supremely the sign that vindicates Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as King. In Acts 2.24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. Why? Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was not possible for the grave to hold down this one of whom there is none greater. In chapter two, verse 36, Peter says, let all the house of Israel therefore know, let Israel know, here's your sign, for certain that God has made him both Kurios, Lord, and Christos, Christ, Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Why? Because he was raised from the dead. In 1315, they said that you killed the author of life. This isn't just a messenger, an emissary, a prophet. He's the author of life who rose from the dead. Or 1735 in Acts, Paul says to Greeks, to Gentiles, that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. How do we know? And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. His authority is supremely vindicated in the resurrection. And finally, in Romans chapter one, verse four, Paul writes that he was, Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, the anointing spirit, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, declared son of God by his resurrection from the dead in the power of his anointed spirit. This is he of whom there is none greater. And the resurrection is the greatest affirmation. It is the greatest sign. So what's the response to that? Verse 41, Jesus very, very clearly warns that the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. You know that the scroll of Jonah is read every year in synagogue at the afternoon service after five days after Yom Kippur, the most, actually on the day of Yom Kippur, the most holy day of the calendar. Jonah is an important book and the message that it has to the, nation of Israel was significant. Jesus points to it. You esteem this book, do you? You esteem the message. You esteem a message of grace and you reject the author of it. What a comparison. Think with me on the model he gives. Notoriously godless Ninevites, the capital of Assyria that destroyed the, tether, the 10 north nations, uh, northern kingdoms of Israel the notoriously godless Ninevites. They repented at a word from Jonah. Jonah didn't perform signs. He didn't do great miracles. And he came to Gentiles, godless, uneducated in the word of God, peoples who perpetrated great atrocities of evil and hated God and his people. And they repented. At this little rebellious, reluctant prophet. And Jesus says, something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. And that is why, that is why Nineveh will rise up against you. Nineveh will rise up. Gentiles with far less light embraced the simple message of repentance. And you with far greater light have embraced the God of repentance. 
You're without excuse. You're more culpable. They were given a tiny twinkle and you have the blazing sun standing before you of whom there is none greater and you reject him. There will be greater condemnation for you is what he's saying. And in verse 42, it's not only Nineveh, it's the queen of Sheba. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. This mounts an even greater contrast. You might say, how? Think with me. First of all, this is the Gentile way from the south who came to see the king. This is, this is the one, it says, for she came from the ends of the earth, a very long and difficult journey. It underscores her eager interest and her costly investment to seek out the king of the Jews. And so she comes. And what does she do? She is deeply impressed. Let me just read to you from 1 Kings 10, verse 5. There was no more breath in her after she saw and heard Solomon. In chapter 10, verse seven, she says, I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. The praise she gives to Solomon and one greater than Solomon is here. Verse nine, she says this to him, blessed be the Lord, your God, who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Oh, how they should have said the same. Look at the comparison again. He says something greater than Solomon is here. And yet they refuse to be impressed at the one of whom there is none greater. This is striking. It is disturbing. Here's a Gentile who doesn't know the scriptures, doesn't know God, doesn't have anticipation for his gift. And she has an earnest interest at a great expense to herself. She goes to seek him. She goes to him and then she responds tenderly and faithfully. And it's of Solomon. One greater than Solomon is here. This is an, in, an outrageous indictment. If you, were, if you were among the scribes and Pharisees, Proud in your heritage, leaning on your scholarship and knowledge and works of righteousness. How this would have been repulsive. Why? Because both examples, Jesus points to Gentiles. Gentiles respond better than you do to much less light. In both cases, these, these people, the Ninevites and the Queen of Sheba, they had no privileges before God. They were outside the covenant. They were not educated in the scriptures. They had no anticipation for a Messiah. And lastly, both of them responded faithfully to one of much lesser light. Here's the issue. Jesus is showing them your authority is all wrong. You think you can judge me and demand a sign from me. Remember back in the last segment when we looked at how it, it underscored repeatedly how powerful presuppositions are. How powerful your pre-committed thinking is. You'll find a way to get what you want in the outcome of your thoughts. And here he's indicting them. It reminds me that Imagine, imagine an airplane engine as human reason and the airplane as what it is attached to. The engine is designed for the word of God. Without the word of God, all the power of that engine is only disastrous. It will not fly. So while human reason is a powerful engine, when it's detached from the word of God, it cannot fly. It will not go in an orderly pro propelling manner. Instead, it will just gyro and destroy even itself. And that's what's happening here. They're detached from the wings, as it were, of God's revelation. They're not submitting to the wings of God's revelation to guide them and fly them as they think hard with their minds. Instead, they detach and now they just spin out for self-destruction. And he says, look at how foolish you are. With such lesser light, such greater response. 
and I am the one of whom there is none greater. The implications are staggering. Let me just summarize it then. Jonah, Solomon, prophet, wise men, they represent the key authorities by whom God communicates to his people. So come on, scribes. I'll show you examples from the authority of scripture. Jesus is greater than all the types and shadows that point to him, like the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, like the temple. He's greater than the temple. He is greater than all the signs and the wonders that, he, that testify to him, all the healings, all the miracles. He's greater than them all. You shouldn't need them. You should see him. Wise men, prophets, priests, kings, something greater is here and something greater is here that is brought into one person. Of all the greatness that the world has ever had, all of it added up and multiplied will not compare to this one person. None greater than him. So when they say, Show us a sign and we will determine if, if you are great. He says, no. True authority derives from the one of whom none is greater. And so I ask you personally, what authority rules your heart? What authority guides your thinking? What authority are you under in your perspective and interpretation of life? What authority? Spurgeon said it well that a divided authority is as bad as none at all. Can't have a divided authority. Because what would a man do with two heads that want to go in two different directions? There can only be one captain of a ship one central source of rule. And that leads right to our next point, a pretended neutrality. So he addresses the fallacy of their pretended neutrality. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 43, he tells a story. The unclean spirit has gone out of a person. It passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. And it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty swept and put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. And so also will it be with this evil generation. Jesus reaches back to what sparked his official rejection in the last, last segment. But it is not precisely about the exorcism it's not what this story is about. In fact, it's not about spiritual war tactics at all. If you think this is about spiritual warfare tactics, you've completely missed the point. That's why I wanted to take all three of these together. Otherwise, especially these last two, are going to be easily missed. The whole point here is that he is addressing those who were seeking signs. Look at verse 39. He says, he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. And now look again right here how he ends this story. Verse 45 at the end. So also will it be with this evil generation. This is his final warning to the nation. And it is cast in an allegory about this evil generation. It's a story about those who want to see the sign and who are not accepting him. What is its key meaning? Well, it certainly involves unbelief, doesn't it? It uniquely emphasizes the evil of progressive hardness. Watch it, progressive hardness of heart. There's a sense here in which there's a, a condition that only becomes worse through unbelief. It speaks clearly of moral reform because Demons were being cast out of Israel as the king himself and the presence of his kingdom is coming in and, and confronting them. The kingdom of God was there in him and the king himself was sweeping their house and setting things in order. But even so, 
Israel did not welcome her king to take up residence in her house. So they were empty is the key word. They were empty. They were cleaned, but remained vulnerable. And isn't that exactly what Jesus will tell us? Evidently, the issue is this. They they were more interested in moral and religious reform than regeneration. They didn't see their hearts needing change. Reformation without regeneration will only result in degeneration. Let me restate that. Reformation in your life, moral reform without regeneration, new heart, will only result in degeneration. All of Christ's teachings, all of his healings, all of the signs, not only are worthless to them at this point, but will only make things worse for them. They are now more culpable. And here's the danger. Here's the danger for all of us. To be moral is not enough. To be freed from a tyrant is not enough. To be rescued from great evil is not enough. You must have Christ in you. When the king comes and cleans house, it's not enough to have a clean house. You must have him come in. You must have him take up residence instead of leaving it empty. This is their thinking, and it's the thinking of every classic legalist. It's the thinking that I can reform my own life. I can do it. How about you? They think they don't need this Messiah. They don't need this Jesus. I can do it myself. And they end up empty and vulnerable. And it's relevant for every one of us. It has been well said that many are attempting to clean up their own lives with all sorts of man-made solutions and self-help philosophies. Oh, that is so rampant in our day. All over Christendom, people are trying to clean up their lives with man-centered self-helps and philosophies. But they're is great danger in empty religion. So the question is, who rules in your heart? Who takes up residence in your heart? Who takes ownership of your house? This is all aimed to make much of Christ, not just moralism. It's it's aimed to make much of Christ. His purposes are far greater than mere temporary blessing. And contextually, think with me, contextually, this isn't a story about mere moral reform. That would be sort of a out of the blue. This is clearly in context. What is it about? Well, it's bigger and it's more fundamental than just their self-righteousness, just their moralism. After all, the whole focus is on Christ. So here's what it's about. Underneath their assumptions about their own morality is the fatal flaw of failing to renounce self and self-effort and self-work and self-righteousness and yield themselves to Jesus. Underneath this this self-reform is their pretended stance of neutrality. No, we're not with Satan, but we're not with you. Show us a sign so we can decide. Well, this is why Jesus said, look back at verse 30, chapter 12, verse 30. This is why Jesus said, and he's echoing it here in the story. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. You see, they have witnessed the powers of the kingdom of God in him. In him of whom there is none greater. They've witnessed it and they remain an empty house. And that's why in chapter 23, verse 38 and 9, it says, Jesus looking to Israel, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not until you acknowledge me as the one of whom there is none greater. I leave your house empty. That's the point. 
So beware, no one can be neutral before someone of such greatness. No one. It's impossible to be neutral before this Christ. Jesus had just bound the strong man and now he's pointing out to them the danger in which they stand pretending to be neutral. In the end, unless Christ the Lord takes up residence in your house, the house of your heart, you remain powerless to defeat evil. And even more than that, you remain powerless to give an account for your own evils. That's the striking thing. You see, the absence of evil does not mean the presence of God. A, a clean, moral, nice, and kind person does not mean the presence of God. There are many kind people who hate God. The absence of evil does not mean the presence of God. And temporary relief from the consequences of sin it does not mean forgiveness. Just because you have relief from the consequences of sin doesn't mean, temporarily, doesn't mean you have forgiveness. Just because Israel was experiencing the cleaning out of the house, the, the exorcisms of demons, doesn't mean that all of them were receiving forgiveness. This is my plea to you, Christ Church. Oh, press this deeply into your heart and make certain every one of you do not rest tonight until you reckon with this reality that there is no neutrality before Jesus. None. There cannot be. Neutrality is neither right nor safe when Christ is on one side. So, I agree with C.S. Lewis who said, there is no new neutral ground in the whole of the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God or counterclaimed by Satan. There is no neutrality. You're either with him or against him. So, there is no indifference. There is no tolerance. There's no pretended neutrality between Jesus and Barabbas. You're in the crowd. You must you must cry, which one? There's no middle ground. And just like Pilate would say, which one would you choose? So what will you do with Jesus? Will you reject him? Will you accept him? Or will you accept him today and reject him tomorrow? One thing is for certain. There is no neutrality with someone so great. So Jesus was responding to them, isn't he? Your authority's wrong. Your pretended neutrality's wrong. And now he really gets to the main concluding point, and that's centrality. Authority, neutrality, and now centrality. Look at verse 46. After all the warnings Jesus now leverages a situation to do with family ties to teach a crowning lesson to Israel and by extension to us. It has to do with relationships and in the end we learn that it has to do with centrality. It's very, very powerful. Verse 46 it says, While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. What Matthew doesn't say, because he wants to keep it focused on the reason Jesus is going to say what he's going to say, doesn't want us to get distracted. I pray this doesn't distract, but I do want to give some background. Mark tells us plainly that when his family heard what he was doing out here and the whole conflict that was occurring, well, it says this in Mark 3.21, they went out to seize him. They went to grab hold of Jesus to get him out of the crowds. They were afraid for him. Why? Because for they were saying he is out of his mind. And John chapter seven, verse five says, for not even his brothers believed in him. So here's the situation. The natural family that Jesus has, particularly his brothers, did not 
have faith in Jesus. They did not trust him. They did not believe in him. And so at this point, they come because they're concerned for him. And they come, and look at how they come, while he was still speaking. (laughs) What's the impression? Well, they came assuming some priority. They had some kind of claim on him that trumped whatever he was doing. They claimed first priority. They came in and they would just interrupt him, interrupt his teaching. Well, I think when all of the synoptics say that they stood outside, there's something more than meets the eye. They stood outside. In Mark chapter 3, verse 32, it says, the crowd was sitting all around Jesus. In verse 34, it says, and those who sat around him, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. So there's a contrast between those who sit around him and those who are on the outside. And in Mark's account, he says in chapter 4, when he talks about the parables, which are coming, he says, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. That's what's happening. His family, his natural family is coming and they're on the outside. And so verse 48 and 9, he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, and there's a word that the ESV drops, I don't like that, but it drops it and it's the word behold again. Behold, here are my mother and my brothers. Remember that uh, in a day like ours where the family is so tragically assaulted, we, we might not be so shocked by this because it's so common for, for wicked hearts to assault God's blessed gift of family. But in this culture, This would have been nothing less than outrageous. These people would have been shocked that Jesus didn't sort of demonstrate a priority of the family tie. Family ties in ancient Israel were very, very strong. And so the lesson presented here is is quite unusual. It's intended to be arresting and it marks a pivot point. It's a pivot in the whole story of Matthew. You see, he has already anticipated division in the family, hasn't he? Turn back with me to chapter 10. He's anticipated divisions in the family because of him specifically, because of him of whom there is none greater. Look at this, chapter 10, verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. In verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So we have, this has been anticipated. And then we have our passages. Go back to chapter 12 and look again right here at the end, 46 to 50. And Jesus says, who is, my, who is my family? What are the priority connections? And there's no incident here, no coincidence, that then he immediately launches into parables only. Look at verse 3 of chapter 13. He told them many things in parables. And now let's go to the end of this, which is chapter 13, verse 53. Chapter 13, verse 53. And look what he says. And when Jesus had finished these parables... He went on. Now drop down to verse 55. 1355. Look at how the family again is brought in. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? In verse 56. And are not all his sisters with us? In verse 57. And they took offense at him. In verse 58. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What's my point? My point is this. The parables are sandwiched between two little 
episodes wherein the family is questioned. What are the family connections? And what is the priority of the family? Well, is Jesus against family? Absolutely not. In no way does Christ's words here in 12, 38 to 50, or sorry, specifically 12, uh, 46 to 50, no way do they diminish the value of family or, or dissolve its, its binding ties. In fact, in chapter 15, we're going to see him reinforce by the authority of scripture, reinforce the the perfect beauty and the honor that God has intended with the family. In chapter 15, verse four, he says, God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. In John 19, when he's on the cross, he looks down to John the apostle and he tells him, take care of my mother. And he tells his mother, look, this is the son that will take care of you. He makes provision for his blessed mother, his earthly mother in this tragic time. So the point is clear, loyalty to God and loyalty to family. These are not incompatible. It's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of understanding these priorities with clarity and power. Remember also just a quick note in Acts 1:14, in Acts 1:14 it says all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So Mary and his brothers become disciples eventually. This we know. But for now, back to Matthew 12. He stretches out his hands towards his disciples. After he questions, what are my family ties? He stretches out his hands towards the, his disciples and he says, behold. What was the goal of the incarnation? Think about it. What was the goal of the incarnation? Was it for God to come in order to experience earthly family dynamics? <laughs> or was it to reveal God? Was it to fulfill all righteousness? Was it to atone for sin? Was it to reconcile sinners to God? You see, the whole point of the incarnation testifies. He didn't come to make family his priority. He didn't come to experience family. He came to save. And the issue then is, did he come to seek and to save the family? Or did he come to seek and to save the lost soul? This is not against family, but it is intently focused on the necessity to understand that some within the natural physical family will not decide for Christ. Some will have the wrong authority and pretend to be neutral for a time. Some will maybe accept and then reject. Some will not. And then what's your priority? This is an ultimate consequence that he's dealing with. And he's pointing out that the family is precious. Yes, that the family is from God, that the family is great, but Christ is one of whom there is none greater. Christ is greater than family. Christ is greater than all. Augustine got it. He said, yes, blood may be thicker than water, but the spirit is thicker than both. And it is true. Verse 50, he says, whoever does the will of my father. Well, John, catch this. John 6, 40 says, this is the will of my father. That everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Now, contextually in Matthew 12, we know that the will of his father is preeminently done by Jesus. It's fulfilled by Jesus. He's the only one who fulfills the will of the Father that's always pleasing. He's the only one that does it perfectly. So, obedience does not make you a child of God, but having eyes to see and perceive Jesus as the Christ Believing in him, trusting in him, following him, that identifies you in relation to him. And that 
is the testimony that he's pointing out. Faith in Jesus is the only way that a person can be included in God's family. Faith in Jesus is the only way that you can be included in God's family. And that is supremely important. That's where he's going. Isn't that the point? John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Faith in Jesus is the way to be included in the family of God. Why? Because Christ alone is righteous. Christ alone can atone for our sins. And Christ alone can save us, forgive us, and reconcile us to a holy Father. I got another reference. That's why Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 say this. For it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, oh, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder and their salvation, the founder of their salvation, perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why. He is not ashamed to call them brothers. <laughs> That's staggering. The one of whom there is none greater is not ashamed to call us brothers. That's the family priority. But he's not just a mere brother. For John, remember how we said earlier, the whole, what's happening here is he came to his own and his own did not receive him. It goes on in John, verse 12 of John 1. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he, the Christ, gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of, the, of man or the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And I believe based on the grammar that he gave them the right, that Christ gave them the right to become children of God. And it was not by their will, but by his who is God. For John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In verse 18, it says that no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the father's side, the God who is at the father's side, he has made him known. This Jesus is the one of whom there is none greater. And that's the point. When through Jesus, we are reconciled to the father, his family becomes our family. And that's why 1 John 2.23 says, no one who denies the son has the father. Whoever confesses the son has the father also. What are the implications in the context of Matthew 12? What are the implications for the people of the kingdom here? Well, I think one commentator nailed it. Keener says this. Those who suppose, listen carefully. Those who suppose they have some natural claim on the kingdom have no claim on it at all. How does it fit right here? The nation has rejected him. They assume they have some natural family-like tie to the promises of the kingdom. They assume that through their blood and ethnicity and through the family lineage that they are children of God. And he stands upon them and says, no. The only way you're a child of God is through me. It is not based upon your family heritage. It is based upon faith in me. It is a crowning statement about his centrality. Can I show you one thing? Look at this. Look at the four times in verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation. Verse 41, judgment with this generation. Verse 42, judgment with this generation. And verse 45 at the end, so also will it be with this generation evil generation. Four times in this little pass, in this little segment here, he is stressing this generation, the nation who assumes a natural, physical 
family entitlement will not be my family and will not be the family of God. Only through faith in me. That's his point. D.A. Carson says it well. Henceforth, the disciples are the only family Jesus recognizes. That's the point. It reminds me of what happened in Deuteronomy 135. Moses says, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers from God. Well, let me, let me remind us of a couple things as we close. I want us to see also an invitation here for you personally and for the world at large. This is a very powerful and heavy message against the nation, that nation which blasphemed his anointing, that nation which will not be forgiven for that, that crucifixion, that nation, that generation. But when he says whoever, he means whoever, anyone at all, whoever, whoever does the will of my father, they are in the family. Whoever looks to me and trusts in me, they are in the family. It also reminds us as we are Christ's people, we are the children of God, not by our blood, not by our ethnicity, but by faith in Christ, that we are people who should care for one another as if we were family members. That it is our calling to show the world a family-like love in the church of Christ. That a Christ-centered identity, security, unity, these kinds of things, the basic needs of human love will be met and ministered and modeled in the church. It is also interesting, and I think it's a needed correction in our day when so many are confused about this, either on one extreme seeking to destroy the family or on the other extreme making it an idol and not seeing Christ central. And I think the corrective goes like this. God's household is the model. The households of the earth are to reflect God's household, which means that the church is the model for the family and that the family is not in that way over the church. So what is the takeaway? What is the main takeaway when he deals with a family like this? It's this. In the end, it's relating to Jesus, isn't it? The all important matter remains how people relate to Jesus. That's the issue. Ultimately, they're saying, it's your relatives. And he's saying, this is how you relate to me. Ultimately, it's about him. The whole point here turns on who is intimately related to Christ. One last reference. Matthew 19, verse 29. Look at what it says. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, for my name's sake, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. There's the key. It's for Christ's name's sake. He is the one of whom there is none greater, none, nothing can compare. So I ask, what relationships in your life define that which there is none greater? What is the sun to the solar system of your life? Think with me. Think about the importance of this. Jesus is he of whom there is none greater. His own people, the evil generation that did not receive him, the fateful line has been crossed and what follows comes only by parables because they don't relate to him by faith because seeing they do not see. Do you? Do you see? Do you see the supreme greatness of Jesus Christ? Is there anyone or anything greater than Christ in your life? 
Deal with that today. There is no neutrality. And what is the authority upon which you make your judgment? As I close this, I thought of a story. I can't get it out of my head. King Louis of France, Louis the Fourteenth. Well, he called himself Louis the Great, and he convinced nearly a whole nation that he was great. Well, he died. And in a cathedral packed with mourners and patrons, paying tribute to their great king, the whole cathedral was dark and not a single candle lit, but one on the casket to represent his singular greatness. And as the service began, a hush went over the crowd. And the bishop stands and slowly walks toward the casket, reaches over, snuffs out the candle. A lingering silence remains in pure darkness. And four words are heard. Only God is great. Only God is great. Do you trust and value Jesus through the gospel? Do you see your desperate need of him and cry out to him? Does your life revolve around him? Do you make much of Christ as one of whom there is none greater? I pray you do today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of knowing you. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for Christ and his greatness. Oh, I pray earnestly for your church and for all who would tune in. Oh God, give all a heart to see the greatness of Christ. And may it transform the way we think, the authorities in our lives. May it transform the decisions we make and where we take our stance. And may it transform what is the sun about which we orbit. May it transform our whole lives. May we make much of Christ in and through everything. For he alone is great. For his glory and our joy, we pray. Amen.